Hello everyone, Game Methuselah here. I wanted to start by making a series on my channel on demystifying painting. Some of you have already seen a couple of things I've discussed, so you kind of know where I'm going. But I want to keep this broken up into bite-sized pieces so no one falls asleep. A couple quick things to start. For all of those who've given me nice feedback about I should stop saying I'm sorry, well, um, I'll do my best and I apologize. Um, secondly, and I wanted to make a small confession here. Um, you guys have got to do me a favor and keep it very quiet because I don't want to lose my rep and my street cred here. Um, as a miniature painter, I have no talent. I am the Antonio Scalieri of miniature painting. I can see quality. I can recognize quality. I've influenced quality. But myself, I'm mediocre. I have a golden demon. Um, I have some notoriety in the in painting, but really all of that has become because of determination, uh, learning and creating techniques, which I'm going to share with you. Um, years of practice and just desire to do it. I love to paint. I really, really enjoy painting and I'm willing to work all the time to improve my skills. And that's what I'm hoping that everyone else here who sees this will do. It's not tough. It's really not. It's really pretty easy to get started. It's pretty easy to produce some figures that are really excellent. When my friend Steve passed away, I, I, it was very tough for me. But when he had a stroke a few years, a few years previous to that, he stopped painting. And I said, no, you can't do that. You got to paint. And he said, I can't even hold a miniature. And I said, no, I'll buy you a vice, a little clips on it. You can hold a miniature. And after a while, you know, his first pieces looked terrible. But as he kept painting, he kept getting better and better and better till at one point he said, look, I've exceeded my skill at what I used to be able to paint before the stroke. He goes, can't sign my name, but I can paint and people will pay money for my painted figures. And they did. So like our friend Antonio, who influenced the likes of Franz Litz, Franz Schubert and Beethoven, maybe somebody out there is a Mozart miniature painter and I'll be able to influence him. So someday he can point to me and say, hey, that old bald guy gave me a lots of good influence and helped me out in my painting. Want to talk to you a little bit about the silvers. We did the rub and buff. Um, I think you saw. I like uh, Liquitex, the soft body silver here and their golds. But almost any kind of silver will work for you. This is good. It's a little expensive, but I really like it. Um, I kind of did a little bit here just to show you uh, the difference between the rub and buff here and a little bit of dry brushing I did on the blade. So what we could do is maybe do a little on the back side. Um, few rules I do for painting. Um, always when you're speed painting, paint in one palette. You don't need to be doing three or four or five or six different colors and alternating away from them. Thusly, I do things in a, in a row. Normally paint between five, ten plus miniatures. And I think you'll get into that when you're doing speed painting. Um, one palette makes it easy. You can always come back and do your second color, third color. And what will happen is the miniatures will look raw as you're building them. But eventually, once you put the last color and wash on, they'll all sort of all come together as a big group. And it's pretty rewarding. Also, keep the paint thin. You don't need to have the paint thick. Um, I'll do a little dry brushing on the back side here of the blade. Um, very much as I did the rub and buff, but you can't buff it. I mean, the color goes on and then it's on. It's not going to change tone. So what you can see is a lot of times I do this with blades when I have rougher rub and buffed armor. And I gets me an effect I like. Now I would go back maybe and paint this little dragon hilt in gold using paint as well. Or I might put an ink wash of yellow on it. Uh, one, either one of those programs work. So... I can use silver, I do do it, but I, my preference, of course, as you already heard in my last video, is rub and buff. To the point of stain in one palette, I'm going to do brown. I pulled all these out for that purpose, and we'll go. Now, first thing I'm going to do is show you how to use my absolute favorite and best technique, which I call slop it on. I'm not really meticulous about staining within the lines. I think a lot of novice painters end up losing interest in painting and stop painting because they get stuck in this concept that they have to stay within the lines. And you don't. When you've done rub and buff or you have a large metal figure like this, you kind of want to try to keep as close to the figure as, as possible without going into the silver because if you do, then you have to either clean it off or you have to go back and touch it up with paint. And I don't really like doing either. But for this like orc here, we'll just assume since we're staying in the brown color palette that we're going to do brown, I'm just going to slop his paint on. Again, keeping it thin is always good because you can always add more paint. It's much easier than trying to take it off. I don't care if it flows over to his dreadlocks, 
Um, I don't care if it flows over into other things that I'm going to later paint. The only partial that I'm going to be sort of careful on is underneath his chin here where it's going to mess up to the armor and do that. Now, as you'll see, I actually overpainted right here. So one thing you could do is you could try to clean it off, which will fail, but it'll make it a little easier. And then later I will go back with a little silver paint or maybe a little gray paint and add it in. But for the most part, I get the color on. You do the same with his arms and all that as well. Um, I'm not going to do it to save time, but basically it's the same feature. You want to be a little meticulous when you're going close to where he's holding it on a grip or where he's holding it in the hilt. But for the most part, if you're painting figures that have no metal around them, just feel free to slop it on and get the paint all over the place. It's not going to be a problem. I mean, you're going to come back later and do his dreadlocks, and then you can be a little bit more meticulous, but it's still the same. You can always fix a problem later. It's much faster. But the dry brushing will do a lot to fix problems. Washes will do a lot to fix problems. All those will take care of your issues for you, and you won't have to deal with them um, on an individual basis. The people who usually quit, a lot of times they're trying to be so meticulous, putting each color on just so perfectly, and then they over brush and they're like, oh my gosh, I've ruined it. And you have it. You haven't heard it at all because remember, what you want is the final outcome, how the miniature looks when you're done, not how it looks while you're painting it on a table with 10 other miniatures of a similar type. On this little miniature you might have seen, I mentioned where I showed you the little tip about painting the clear ones white. The white base is now been mounted onto a, a magnet. Um, I painted the area brown. I've not done this before. I used uh, the other miniatures of these, and I just basically took them exactly as they were and glued them onto um, a base and then stuck them in my collection. Did some flocking on the base, which I'll later do on this one. But I wanted to show you, again, we're staying in the same palette. So I take my, my light brown here, and I dry brush it off. And then slowly, you put very little pressure to start, because you're not 100% sure how much paint you have on your brush. But if you put it on slowly, you can then start putting more pressure as you go or as more pressure as you want certain areas to have more color. Um, and then, of course, as you wear off the brush, there'll be less paint on it. So it will allow you to basically become more cavalier with your brush strokes. But as you can see, none of this was hard. Surely none of it takes a long time. And you've achieved a due tone. Now, I've seen myself and even others who might dry brush a mid-level brown and then come back with a very, very light brown. You can get even highlights, so you can get three or four tones. But in for speed painting, I think that's an error. It's not necessary. Again, you just take the thing, you rub off most of the paint, you can, and then very much like I had showed you with the using of the rub and brush, work similarly. Then you just go ahead, slowly applying pressure, more this time because I have a a better feel for how it's going to look. So I didn't have to be as gentle. But, you know, I always suggest you start gentle and then add pressure as you go. Again, the, the thing is, if you add too much and you get a big blotch of paint that you don't like, again, it's not going to be a problem because you're going to do a wash on it afterwards. Now, mostly I do ink washes now, but if you don't have the finances for the ink washes, you can use basic paint. And, and then it's done. Now, this is a pre-painted figure type thing. So, you know, you're you're basically working on a figure where you're not really as concerned. This is another one of the little pre-paints. I like this little half-work monk. So again, it's gonna be the same. Now here, I'm a little more careful because his surfaces are thin. There's not a lot of detail, so it's gonna be harder to pick stuff up. So you wanna start slowly and then just, you know, build your brush strokes up as you go. And always think about maybe lighting how this figure is gonna be shaded. But this is gonna, I knew it would be a very tough figure to rub and buff. I mean, I'm sorry, to dry brush because there's not a lot of detail for the paint to catch. It's much smoother. So you've got to be a little bit more careful. But the careful part is not a matter of you have to worry about if you get a blotch or a mistake, because you'll see, I think I've got more too much paint here. But when I give it a wash, the wash is gonna to tone that all down and it's gonna flow into all the low areas of the paint. So that dark brown wash will change the tone. Again, with the old slop it on idea, I don't really kind of care as much as it gets on the black because it's still a highlight and worn black sometimes can be brown. But the slop it on really works most when you're putting all your base colors. It's, again, it's the idea to save yourself time and speed. I like this fig because he has a really large cloak in the back. So you've got a lot of area that you can get a buff effect on. Again, once again, I think I put too much on there but that will get taken care of with the wash and you can always come back and do more brushing 
as you have, as you feel like it. Now I'm a little harder for me because I'm used to painting in an entirely different way than to try to make this visual for the camera. So it's a little tough. I normally would have it up higher. I'd be working, you know, in a different facing than trying to do this. But the idea I think you're going to get for what happens on these figures. Now, the reason I usually paint four or five figures at a time is essentially when I finish this one, this one or even one or two more that I'm going to show you, uh, the others will be dry. And then you can go back and add the ink wash immediately. So it just it's like a big conveyor belt of figures that you're constantly painting. Keep going it. And again, I'm going to stop here, even though I might go on a little bit more if it was just working on it. But I wanted to show some different figs. Here's a finished figure of the pre-paintings that I actually just took and kind of liked it the way it was. Threw a flock base on it, a little blue wash on the clear, is clear, semi-clear translucent uh, battle axe. But now I, I kind of like in this figure, so I want to add a little bit more detail. So again, I, I step in and I'm going to like start to dry brush. Dry brush and a wash can really bring these figures to life. It can bring many figures and most figures to life, but the beauty of it is, as you're building a collection, anything that saves you time, that allows you to get onto another figure and do something else, is what you want. Because you eventually, if you're going to be painting miniatures for role playing, or gosh, if you get into army games, which would really be great, you're going to be painting hundreds and hundreds of figures. My friend Dana Hone is doing a little video bit that he wants me to try to get hooked up for him, which will be great, me figuring out how to do that. But he tends to paint figures in the hundreds at a time because he's painting armies. He's working on a, an English Civil War army right now, and I think he's painting 200 figures at one time. So I said, hey, give me some info on that, and I'll, I'll show people. But he uses a very similar technique to what I do. Um, it's just dry brush and wash. It's kind of the main secret, and it's really easy to do. And I'm not looking to make you guys you know, massively golden demon painters, as I said in my little startup here. I don't think my skill's that good, but there's lots and lots of videos on there of people who are really excellent, who are willing to teach you. But again, you can see the dry brush working in here. Now that I've got a second tone, I would do another dry brush on this in, in gray for the black pieces. And then afterwards, like I say, with the slop it on, because believe me, these, these miniatures that are painted over in China are slopped on, I would go back and fix things where you see his frost beard is actually brown at the edge here because people overdid it. Well, after I finished that, I would go back and then detail that out a bit. You kind of don't need to, because really, if you put it on the table, no one's really going to notice it. But, you know, I'm kind of a little bit more of a perfectionist on it, so I tend to do that. Again, more of these pre-paint The only reason I'm using them is because I think you can fix them fast, and I want to do that. And it's a lot easier than me showing you how to just slop paint on, like I did with a little orc, and then having to wait for it to all dry. So that's basically the whole the whole deal on that. Now, I'll give you an idea of quick wash, but I think I'm going to do that a little bit more detail because I'm afraid the videos are going to start running a bit late, and I don't want to get into that. But often when you're painting these little inks or washes or just dark, dark brown paint will do this for you. Like the little orc that I slopped it on, I kind of want to see his detail a little bit better for painting, so I'll just give him a wash. Now, the, the thing that does is it brings all the detail out. It also did that bit where I had the little screw-up on the bottom. It covers it up. So you end up with a situation that you're not going to have uh, to go back and necessarily fix it. And then you would do it on the others. That's a nice way to look at your figure. And in many ways, sometimes you look at him and go, gee, that, it almost looks done. And in many cases, that's kind of how it works. Um, as you get into, like, the little little ghost or ghoul or a little ghost or spirit here. Again, a brown wash, and I'm using that earth shade I spoke about, uh, but almost any sort of brown ink, brown wash will work. But now what I've done is I've effectively come on with a nice subtle, well, maybe not so subtle in some cases, tonal quality. And when this dries, which will happen fairly quickly, and again, like I said, if I was painting 10 figures at a time, you'd be able to see that they are all basically going to end up looking like this. Now, the next thing I would do is I would get green ink or something and do the ectoplasm so that it would be, you know, kind of ghosty or something. And, I, and then, depending on how well I like that, I'd go back with maybe a dark brown or the earth shade again on that. 
but there's a point there. Now, you'll see the real wet spot there. That's going to show in substantially more dark than areas where, obviously, there's, it looks like it's already dry. And that's what I want. It's the variance of tone in paint that you're going to want. Now, you can see this has taken still very little time, and it's really, really simple. Again, the little monk. A little orky monk friend here. Um, when I paint, by the way, normally I use, uh, uh, since I magnetize everything, I put it on a little paint jar that has a metal top or a piece of metal or anything you want to make that can that can work with that. And again, here's the same thing. We're putting it over this cloak area. Even the area, as I said, that I thought I got too much on, it's going to tone down. So it's going to still be bright and much more visible. But again, you can always add more shade to dark it down or different browns. A darker brown would work, different types of browns would work. So it allows you to get the effect you want. But the point still is washes, dry brushes are very, very fast. They're very, very simple. And at the end of the day, you've actually made quite a nice looking figure out of something that kind of looks pretty mediocre. Now in this, I might just throw the brown wash right onto his skin too, um, so that that gets me the tonal changes I want on that. So I'm not even going to mess with this figure, maybe much more beyond this. I'm just going to flock the base. Um, which I'll more likely show you in a future video on some of the things I do. Mostly, I do very simple flock. I just throw a, a dirt-colored paint on the base and then stick green or brown or sand floss, whatever kind of flock I want to do it. But here, in what few minutes you've seen me work on this figure, um, I'm ready to basically put this, flock this base and put this in my box if I was going to use it for a group. And... You know, everybody always needs to have a half-orc monk. I mean, you know, what D&D &D adventure party is not complete without a half-orc monk? But there it is. And it's still wet, but when it all dries out, you know, all these tones will have blended out and they'll look good. And again, the beauty of it is if you're not completely happy with the initial, you can always add more. And since, of course, since all acrylics are pretty much water-soluble, you can keep playing with it. I'll eventually talk to you about more advanced techniques like um, wet painting and the like. But this pretty much is the main secret of figures that are for fast, speed-painted type items. And it's not hard. And that is the beauty of it. You, know, you throw some paint on there, you kind of maybe get it in the lines, and then you go back and you just give it a little earth shade wash. The brown covers, you can even go into the green if you want. It, it doesn't matter. Um, but the idea is you're, you're building shadows and shade, shade cones and everything else like that and making the figure more interesting. Again, always more difficult when you have a larger flat surface because there's less for it to grab onto. But again, if you keep it thin and you work on it, eventually it'll, it'll start to do the things you want. I think at this point I've started to run longer than I wanted to, so I'm going to stop on that. Um, I'm going to go ahead and make some more series on how to paint and what you'd like to do and show you different techniques you can do with all kinds of different things. Um, until then, uh, fight me devils, for I hate peace. Have a good day.